we thought about this ki let's start some series where it uh, attributes not only to a physical and diagnostic conditions of the patient but also regarding mental health nowadays people are aware of so much of about mental wellness so that uh, they wanted to have uh, some sort of counseling session by the different experts so we also thought ki, okay let's start some webinar series which can help all the other colleagues and doctors to have something about various diseases where mental health can play an important part recurrent pregnancy loss is such one of the topic where a single loss also can create a lot of negative vibes not only in the mind of a woman but also for a couple and the whole family and let's believe this ki today still most of the population resides in tier 2 tier 3 and the villages where a childless woman also considers as a social taboo or something like that so before going ahead i would like to introduce uh, something about medal healthcare limited which has started the series uh, let me share something about the company so medal healthcare private limited is considered still as number 1 in radiological and pathological integrated system so it's not only about pathology or radiology uh, we are still find medal is south india's largest integrated diagnostic concern where the services consist of both pathology and revenue with almost like 40 to 60 percentage above in addition to that there are almost like 1 crore customers which are touched on an annual basis with the help of certain uh, doctors and corporate tie ups and other services so mostly the pathological service consists of starting from routine cbc and urine analysis to till the higher end specialized and super specialized test including molecular biology and genetic testing and not only that in radiology also medal provides a uh, routine testing from starting from ecg and x ray to ct mri color dopplers or all those things in addition to that because of this integration of diagnosis medal provides a lot of wellness packages so the patient don't need to go anywhere else so over a period of time medal understood ki not only this is required it also need to put something in mental awareness where we can provide certain patients the benefit of mental health counselings and mind consultation so that's how this mind consultation or medal mind has been created so this is a service network you can see mostly typical four south indian states of karnataka andhra pradesh tamil nadu and kerala uh, full of medal so medal has almost like 22 nabl accredited lab but also it also has a centralized qa system which manages the quality of nabl and non nabl accredited lab to a certain standards of nabl so it's almost like 1 crore patients or customers usually are been touched with the help of this approximately 8000 customer points 45 to 50000 doctors and 700 near about 700 corporate types and i also had some ppp tie up with the governments in andhra pradesh and jharkhand and tie up with the government in karnataka state also various awards in over a year so latest being best medical diagnostic laboratory and during covid times medal was a largest private covid testing facility in the south india uh, these are some of the highlights uh, after this i would like to uh, introduce sorry dr anita kant who is the moderator for dr anita dr anita kant who is the moderator for today's session so dr anita kant is one of the highly appreciated and experienced gynecologist in india she has started her career from escort sars institute in faridabad which became like a forties and around 2010 she has shifted to asian institute of management system science where she is working as a chairman of obstetrics and gynecology trust she has been associated with various organization like foxy ima uh, menopause society in addition to this excellence in profession she also is an avid writer and uh, she has written a lot of things around pregnancy child birth which is related to parenting she has many successful stories but i think the latest one was uh, successful child delivery by 52 year old woman 
and that took triplets. So I welcome Dr. Anita. Uh, I would request Madam to take it ahead. Thank you so much. Um, since uh, Dr. Kamini Rao is uh, stuck up somewhere and will be joining us a bit later, I would request you, Dr. Ramesh Kina, to uh, pres give your presentation so that uh, we don't waste time of our listeners. Oh, sure, ma'am. Mm. Let me share my presentation. Yes, please. Uh, basically, we are talking about recurrent pregnancy loss today. And uh, it is a very valid uh, point because a mother plans and plans and plans a pregnancy, a couple rather. They plan their pregnancy, okay, we'll have a birth, childbirth in this month or maybe this year when we finished uh, building a house or we finished uh, taking care of our careers, we, are, we have reached where we want and then they find it called goes boom. So once a uh, abortion is one thing, but if it happens more than one time, it is very disheartening. And uh, that is what recurrent pregnancy loss is all about. Uh, today we will be presenting where all we can help these couples in uh, gaining their uh, dream child, as uh, we say, and uh, giving them happiness and uh, sharing their hopes with them. Because uh, losing a pregnancy is a very, very painful thing. It's not only painful for the couple, for the whole family, even for the doctors who are treating them. And uh, Medol have come up with certain packages where uh, the tests can be done. We'll be talking to Dr. Um, Rao about where and what tests need to be done and uh, what all needs to be explored and uh, uh, you know what history to be taken, how to deal with these uh, women and couple, uh, both of them at one time. In the meantime, I'll request Dr. Ramesh Kina to talk about uh, what uh, uh, packages in tests they are offering because then they come out to be very cheaper and in one go, you have a whole panel of tests where you know, okay, this is what is lacking and this is how we go ahead by treating this point. To Over to Dr. Ramesh Kina. Thank you, ma'am. I will try to do my best in this. I hope uh, everyone can see the PPT. Ritu, tell me if uh, anything is missing or something like that. Uh, sir, slides are visible, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, madam, about this opportunity. So today we are going to discuss about something about recurrent pregnancy loss. Uh, I know Dr. Kamini Rao is a stalwart in this. So I would wanted to have a touch up of few of the investigations. But let me start with this. So we wanted to understand what is recurrent pregnancy loss, what are the etiologies behind this and what investigations to be done based on this today's webinar. So we understand not only uh, physically, there is a lot of psychological effect because of any pregnancy loss. Now, and if it continues on, if it happens multiple times, that creates a very negative impact for the family. We all know that in any given pregnancy, the reported risk is still 15%. But when that happens, the chances become more and more in the next. So by definition, as per the European society and American society, it consists of two or more consecutive or spontaneous pregnancy loss. Now, if the woman has earlier live birth successful, it's called as secondary RPL. And if there was no live birth continuous, every pregnancy has been lost, it's called as primary. So this usually affects one to 2% of women in reproductive age. It can sometimes pregnancy also classified losses as occult loss and early before 12 weeks and late after 12 weeks. Now there are certain risk factors which increases the risk of this loss. First and most important is maternal age. So ideally we consider as 25 to 35 year of a female which is having a very good chance of having a live birth and all this. As the age increases, the risk increases. In fact, now it's uh, become routine for all the gynecologists to have a double marker and triple marker during the evaluation of ANC to understand maternal age risk also. Second risk factor would be any previous miscarriages. Now, if anything happens, the consequence or subsequent and loss can be on the higher side, sometimes 40%. Now, the third is during 
the modern era there are so much of lifestyles and changes including smoking whether it's an active passive alcohol and the way we are living there is full chances of uh, high prevalence of obesity these are also the risk factors of recurrent losses uh, clinically i would uh, let it dr kamini uh, to handle uh, there are certain now over a period of so many years so many studies has been done so still we are able to classify some of the losses based on the etiological causes so based on this uh, and on the investigations which can be provided there can be genetic causes either in the parents or in the fetus we will come to that uh, most important causes are autoimmune causes because they can be easily treatable then there are certain endocrine factors which are also studied whether they are increasing the risk or not and infectious like tors mycoplasmas we have also come across during means uh, recent years about the thrombophilic disorders which actually leads to uh, various thromboembolisms so now there is a what do you call full awareness of thrombophilic disorders like inherited or acquired then due to our lifestyle environmental causes also in, can happen now 10 to 15 cases also are due to anatomic malformations like uterine malformation cervical incompetencies fibroids these people are still studying about the male factors because it's not only women which may have causes there are certain male factors but the biggest dilemma or biggest setback for medical society is that still there are causes which are unexplained almost like half of the causes which still not there so we call it as idiopathic so we will talk mostly about uh, genetic causes and autoimmune causes because uh, most of the early losses are due to chromosomal defects while immunological causes are mostly towards the late losses but immunological causes can also be there in the early losses autoimmune disorders we know there is a association of sle along with the losses in second and trimester but uh, most importantly we would like to have our there is a uh, awareness about anti phospholipid syndrome why because still anti phospholipid antibody syndrome is considered as the most treatable cause means patient can be given on anti or warfarin or heparin or all this now this anti phospholipid antibody syndrome is a different chapter altogether to be very frank <clears throat> but this all anti phospholipid anti syndrome what is more important is they consist of anti phospholipid antibodies we will come to that so anti phospholipid is again primary if it is not associated with any other disorder and secondary if it is associated with certain sles or drugs rare cases can have catastrophic where there is a high incidence of generalized thrombosis and mortality so what are these anti phospholipid antibodies so there are three types of antibodies but they are actually not uh, acting on phospholipids they are acting on phospholipid binding proteins so most prominent of antibodies is igg but igm and iga is also there the dilemma comes because it is also seen in 5 to 15% of normal population uh, these are the just pathogenic mechanism where they can either uh, start uh, induce fibrinolysis in inhibition but in rpl they can also do a reduction of proliferation in trophoblastic cells so these are the three important most common into, uh, important antibody antibodies of anti phospholipid syndrome lupus anticoagulant maybe 5 years back we were doing like once a week test now it's a very routine test because many patients come for that uh, second is anti cardiolipin and anti beta 2 glycoprotein antibodies both can be done by elisa and done on serum while lupus anticoagulant is done on plasma so there are other antibodies like phosphatidyl serine inositol and choline out of all these antibodies still lupus anticoagulant antibody test is considered as the strongest indicator for adverse reactions and there are many types of tests for identifying lupus anticoagulant like a prolonged aptt kaolin calling uh, clotting time but most sensitive and specific test still we consider is drvvt that is dilute russell's viper venom type but of all these tests no test is 100% sensitive or specific so we have to 
uh, understand ki this different different test can be done to identify this really there's something about drvvt which we do in a routine laboratory so it's actually in, in vitro ability to induce thrombosis uh, it's not an easy test it consists of three part first we do a screening test where the clotting time is measured if it is on the higher side then we do a confirmation test by adding more and more phospholipid rich drvv reagent and there is also mixing studies then there is a react, uh, calculation of a normalized ratio by calculation of screening and confirmation so if this normalized ratio is more than 1.2 we consider as la detected why mixing studies is important in this case also because there can be some factor deficiencies or inhibitors which can alter the results so mixing studies help us to understand ki whether their particular factor is deficient or inhibitors or it's really la present this is just principle of drvv test where we do a screening test in which clotting time becomes prolonged and when it is corrected by confirmatory reagent then we call it as la is present still diagnosis of this is challenge because titers are very fluctuating different laboratories will have different different standardization different instruments will also have different different standardizations and most important in all these tests are pre analytical variables uh, because these tests are heavily dependent on separation of plasma from the sample then storage and transport temperature of the sample which can alter the result still one clinical and one laboratory criteria is used to identify for a uh, apla i would let clinical criteria to for madam uh, for laboratory criteria again there are three types of antibodies lupus anticoagulant is more specific but anti cardiolipin antibody is more sensitive but to diagnose we call it if it to diagnose it is a positive test either of three these three tests should come positive 12 weeks apart and not only that in cases of antibodies like anti cardiolipin or anti beta 2 glycoprotein their test result should be on the medium or higher side it's not just on in the above normal range now let's come to genetic factors genetic factors can be both from the parents or from the fetus so in parents usually it's found as a uh, structural chromosome abnormality like robertsonian translocation and in embryo it can be monosomy or trisomy so genetic test can be done currently by two types karyotyping by g banding or fish now the basic difference is karyotyping by g banding which is routinely used by culture method almost all chromosomes can be identified but only up to 20 cells can be screened and it has a limitation of high amount of maternal contamination which can give erroneous results the advantage of fish is that it can identify mosaicism and the whole chromosome can be identified with specific target dna probes but again it does not include all the chromosomes now the newer tests like array cgh means uh, comparative genomic hybridization have also come and most of the societies like european american rcog is also recommending that we should start array cgh only for uh, these type of test but again it also has some limitations like uh, maternal contamination and it cannot identify individual mosaicism Uh, this is just an example of how a karyotyping result looks like you can see all the chromosomes there's 3 and 7 uh, balanced translocation now as per the recommendation ideally the product of consum- uh, conception genetic testing is more important than parent testing it's said that when then when the poc uh, testing is abnormal then we should also go for parental testing so again this uh, left hand side is uh, fish and this is now karyotyping with normal g banding nowadays prenatal diagnosis is also getting a lot of awareness so prenatal diagnosis is also can be done by coronic villus sampling or amniotic fluid or cord blood by karyotyping fish or fishes but there are some common indications like advanced very advanced maternal age maternal like dual marker is on the abnormal side with high risk triple quadruple marker is also showing high risk 
if there is suspected uh, duplication syndrome or family history. Just a little bit of prenatal diagnosis. It can be done annuclear screening by double marker, triple marker or by genetic testing. In that also, if you say ki double marker and triple marker, I would say uh, based on the history, sonographic finding and biochemical reaction of double marker always have a highest detection rate. That is approximately 90 to 95% as compared to triple or quadruple marker. Something about thromophilic disorders. Now, this is, has get a lot of what you call uh, awareness in people's and clinicians' mind and Every lab is doing all, almost all these things. So there are like inherited thromophilic defects and some acquired thromophilic defects. All contributes to venous thromboembolism and sometimes pulmonary embolisms and RPL also is a cause. So in inherited thromophilic defects, usually it's a factor 5 laden mutation or factor 2 like protein, prothrombin gene mutation or there is a deficiency of protein C and S. You see a little bit about this. So factor five latent mutation is why it's important because if it's a homozygous mutation, then there's an 80 fold increase of thrombosis, which can definitely affect the fetus and anything. And it's a very high sensitive and specificity PCR based test. The only limitation is that it's still fine in two to 5% of general population. And if the patient is on heparin therapy or they have a blood transfusion, then due to PCR interference, erroneous results can happen. In fact, same with pro, uh, prothrombin gene mutation, that is factor 2 mutation. Again, it's high sensitivity and specific, uh, specificity, but again, the patient on heparin and blood transfusion can alter the results. So protein C and S deficiency is also present in almost 2% of general population. They are less common associated with uh, RPLs or recurrent pregnancy loss, but when they are present, they have a strong association. So this is also done on plasma samples. Now, apart from this, let's come to some endocrine factors. Various studies has been done to find an increased risk of association for pregnancy loss with various disorders. So few of the conditions we can discuss in that hypothyroidism is one of the important cause. And that to subclinical hypothyroidism. Now there is general awareness ki if the TFT or thyroid function test is within normal limits, but if the TSH is more than 2.5, any clinician should think about subclinical hypothyroidism and treat accordingly. In addition, addition to that, it's seen in RPL cases, patient have usually have high level of anti-thyroid peroxidase antibody, anti-TPO than anti-TGs. So that's also an independent marker for increased risk. Diabetes mellitus, uh, if it is controlled, it said no risk, further risk of uh, miscarriages. But yes, if it is poorly controlled, then there is an increased risk. So this can be done by or can be identified by high blood glucose level and high HbA1c level in the first trimester only. And these women usually have high HOMA insulin resistance. So that will always be on the higher side. So these tests also can be uh, understand to find insulin resistance. Polycystic ovarian disease also in some cases it has been identified as a risk factor. So basic because of excessive production of androgens. So there is panel of polycystic ovarian syndrome in most of the laboratories like um, and it also consists of increased testosterone, SHBG and free andro androgen index. There are many studies which also find out luteal phase deficiency because of low progesterone levels. So secretory endometrium, endometrium doesn't get proper. But this diagnosis is difficult because you have to have very timely endometrial biopsy. So currently people are using uh, progesterone, uh, low progesterone levels to find out in three different samples and then uh, addition of those. Are. Hyperprolactinemia is also known as one of the so. If we have to go we, to suspect hyperprolactinemia, definitely prolactin needs to be done. Homocysteinemia, increased homocysteine also is considered as risk factor for uh, thromboidism, but in few of the studies. Many people have already studied for ANA because it's most of the time it's autoimmune. So ANA has been studied, but not uh, much uh, significant association was found with these tests. 
infections usually yes nowadays uh, infection or tort screening is almost a part of the antenatal screening because they are associated with recurrent abortion iugr malformations but not only tort uh, certain cases uh, certain organisms like listeria mycoplasmia are actually uh, associated with the increases but their role is very less clear now for these there are different types of tests available like pcr antibody screening like igm igg important is avidity screening let's under the understand this word so basically uh, for this tort screening presence of igm antibody or we forget normally four fold rise in igg titers it indicates a recent uh, recent infection only igg does not indicate any recent infection but if there is a uh, misunderstanding of the report or how to interpret this we usually should do an igg avidity test also so if the avidity igg is low then it which indicates recent infection but if the avidity is on the higher side then we can consider as past infection the problem is that most of the infections are only subclinical so sometimes it's become difficult to interpret male factors are also being studied in long and most of this as found uh due to excessive or very sedentary or unhealthy lifestyles there can be sperm damage by oxidative stress so there are tests which are available to understand the dna fragmentation of sperm like sperm chromatin dispersion analysis or structural analysis or tunnel tests so now 10 to 15% cases are due to anatomic anatomic factors most of the cases are due to congenital uterine malformations most prominent like septate uterus in addition to that bicornate or eucornate uterus there can be other conditions like fibroids polyps chronic endometritis sometimes cervical incompetence now it's known that for identifying all this is ideally a transvaginal 3d ultrasonography or sonohistography has very high sensitivity and specificity and it should be performed that's the problem still if approximately half of the patients we still don't know what can be the causes so these are the uh, outline of basic investigations which are recommended for evaluation in current practices like for genetic causes we can do genetic testing or karyotyping of parents or karyotyping of the product of conception immunological causes definitely we should do cardiolipin and anti cardiolipin antibodies antibody to glycoproteins lupus antiquitans anatomic causes we have if we suspect we have to go for sonar histography infectious causes we can just find out by do, doing a tort serology or some cultures from the cervical in addition to that our antenatal package also consists of endocrine factors like to see subclinical hypothyroidism or anti thyroid antibodies to find out whether the patient has diabetes or insulin resistance high prolactin or lh going to pcos in addition to this also now for to uh, uh, evaluate thrombophilic disorders we have to do protein cns activity factor 5 and factor 2 uh, mutations so uh, this is a generalized picture there is a, a guideline from royal college american society european society so recently in october 2020 papa that all has come from proposed a new recommendation in this they also say ki okay the first for genetic testing ideal is first we have should do on a product of conception and if it is found abnormal then parental testing should also be done for you uh, anatomical definitely 3d ultrasound and sonohistography should be done anti phospholipid antibodies are also recommended in all the studies and you proposed also specifically for 3 anti cardiolipin and lupus anticoagulin and anti uh, beta 2 glycoprotein thyroid function also to find out or evaluate subclinical hypothyroidism tsh is definitely required and tpo is also being done to find out hyperprolactinemia prolactin is also recommended and to find out diabetes mellitus first trimester hb1c is also recommended now protein c protein these are new tests but if you suspect a small uh, strong family history or personal history of or the history of thrombosis they should also do like protein c protein s and apart from this uh, other tests are not recommended but yes we can actually uh, 
prescribe those tests based on the clinical judgment and history of the patients. Thank you. But I would like to share one more thing which most of the people forget is this. This is generalized list of those tests which we have discussed where what is the methodology. Uh, most important because there are two tests here in lupus anticoagulant and protein CNS which consist of plasma. And these need to be done in frozen plasma. So there are a lot of pre analytical issues which clinician should also know and my laboratory colleagues should also understand and interpret in a Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, you really put in a comprehensive of uh, all the tests that uh, need to be done by a clinician while investigating a patient of whether it's recurrent abortion or uh, even a single abortion. Uh, you have beautifully consolidated the whole presentation. I would like to welcome Dr. Kamini Rao. Thank you, Medol Diagnostics, for giving me this opportunity and for IJCP for kindly hosting this program. And it is my pleasure to take on a difficult subject like recurrent pregnancy loss. I say difficult because we don't have a single answer to this problem clinically or biochemically or radiologically. And I think this is going to be an enigma at the start of my lecture. And I hope I can make this enigma less confusing and with more consensus at the end of my talk. But I would like to tell you that I don't have any magic solutions. But let's start at the very beginning and looking at what the definitions are. Eshri says that more than two pregnancy losses or even equal to two pregnancy losses, which includes biochemical pregnancies and pregnancies of unknown location, pregnancy loss is used as a general term and early pregnancy loss the first trimester pregnancy loss and second trimester pregnancy loss when gestation specific reference is needed. However, when we look at the RCOG, they just categorically say three or more consecutive. That's the word consecutive one after the other pregnancy losses. But the American college say something different. That is two or more pregnancy losses confirmed by ultrasound or histology, not necessarily consecutive. So if we have to look at the incidence here, recurrent, that means one after the other, repetitive, recurrent pregnancy loss occurs in one to 3% of all couples trying to conceive. The risk of pregnancy loss increases with each loss from even as much as 11% and can go in as far as nulli gravida to as much as 40% after three consecutive pregnancy losses. That means almost two out to five and that's quite a lot and that is after three pregnancy losses. But the prognosis worsens with the increasing maternal age. The increased incidence of recurrent pregnancy loss is higher among the infertile women. Now, this is something that one you know, needs to understand. It's not only a physical component, but the psychological impact. It's mind over matter. If it doesn't matter, then it won't mind, but it does mind. And therefore, what is the psychological impact? Pregnancy loss is a significant negative life event and such recurring events may intensify the grief experienced and a sense of personal failure. Childless couples and women may face discrimination stigma and ostracism. Therefore, appropriate support should be offered to reduce the associated psychological burden. 
couples want the medical team to know their obstetric history and to provide compassionate care, show understanding, take them seriously and show empathy and clear information about the cause of miscarriage, the likelihood of recurrence, the tests required and treatment that could prevent a recurrence. Therefore, studies have most focused on women, so there is a need for studies on the emotional impact of recurrence in pregnancy losses on men too. So, what could be the risk factors? The one important risk factors that we are not so familiar with are the genetic factors. The structural chromosomal anomalies are seen in approximately 2 to 5% of recurrent miscarriages. Most common balanced reciprocal or Robertsonian translocations. Others include chromosomal inversions, insertions, and mosaicism. Low maternal age at second miscarriage, history of more than three miscarriages, history of more than two miscarriages in brothers and sisters, and history of more than two miscarriages in parents of either partner all increase the probability of a carrier status. But we can't forget the epidemiological factors or the thrombophilias. When we talk of epidemiological factors, we have to look at the advanced maternal age, and that would be above 35 years of age, and the number of previous miscarriages and advanced paternal age of more than 40 years. And looking at the lifestyle habits, such as maternal smoking, alcohol consumption of more than five units per week throughout pregnancy or over three per week in the first trimester. Caffeine consumption, and that's coffee, three to five cups per day and obesity, illicit drug use like cocaine. What about thrombophilias? Acquired thrombophilias, antiphospholipid syndrome, hyperhomocysteinemia, acquired protein C resistance, inherited thrombophilias, antithrombo 3, protein C deficiencies, protein S deficiency, and factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, common and weakly thrombogenic. What is antiphospholipid syndrome? It is almost accounting for a fifth of these thrombotic episodes. Yes, dear friends, yes, it is a fifth of cases. Most important treatable cause of recurrent miscarriage. Recurrent fetal loss typically occurs in the second trimester and may occur at any stage of pregnancy. Only a 10 to 15 percent of women are antiphospholipid antibody positive. The probability of finding APL in prenatal exams is less than 2 percent. So, what can be an antiphospholipid syndrome diagnostic criteria? At least one clinical criterion that is either a previous thrombotic event or gestational morbidity and at least one laboratory criterion confirmed positive APL at more than two separate time points with a 12-week minimum interval. On my right hand, you have a table which will suggest to you the international consensus classification criteria for the antiphospholipid syndrome and that is the APS. This has been as recent as the fertility sterility of 2012.
Now looking at more of the anatomical factors for the recurrent pregnancy loss are the uterine factors and that could be in the form of abnormal uterine anatomy in the form of congenital and, and malformations, septal uterus, double uteri, arcuate uterus, acquired anomalies like fibromas, uterine polyps, intrauterine adhesions. Women with septate uteri are more likely to miscarry in the first trimester, while those with an arcuate uteri have more second trimester miscarriage. Cervical incompetence are more likely to have a second trimester miscarriage preceding a spontaneous rupture of membranes or a painless cervical dilatation. The lining of the uterus, which we call as an endometrium, gives an impairment in the endometrial quality and may affect implantation and placentation, impaired proper embryo development, miscarriage and recurrent pregnancy loss. Chronic endometritis in 10 to 15 percent of the infertile women and 40 percent of endometrial cases. Looking at the hormonal and metabolic factors, hypothyroidism, antithyroid peroxidase antibodies, Hashimoto's thyroiditis are at risk factors. Treated thyroid dysfunction is not a risk factor for recurrent miscarriage, but uncontrolled diabetes is a risk factor. Hyperprolactinemia may be associated with recurrent miscarriage and that loss is because of the alterations in the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis and impaired folliculogenesis and oocyte maturation and or a short luteal phase. What about the infections? I'm sure you know there are infections in terms of bacterial infections, protozoal infections, viral infections and whatnot. But that would account for almost 0.5 to 5 percent. Infections include listeria monocytogenes, toxoplasmosis, rubella, herpes, measles, cytomegalovirus, coxsackievirus, mycoplasma, urea plasma, chlamydia, and trachomatis. As most of these infections are isolated events, there is apparently limited role for infections as an etiological factor in recurrent pregnancy loss. Proposed mechanisms for infections, causes of pregnancy loss include a direct infection of the uterus, fetus or placenta, placental insufficiency, chronic endometritis or endocervicitis, amnionitis, infected intrauterine device. But so far, we have been talking only about the female factors. Please understand that it can also have male factors. Standard semen parameters, including sperm morphology, are not predictive of recurrent pregnancy loss. Abnormal DNA fragmentation, advanced paternal age, or exposure to correctable environmental factors such as exogenous heat, toxic exposures, varicose seals, or increased reactive oxygen species in semen, or ROS as it is called. Unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss where no apparent causative factor is identified in over three quarters of the couples. Chances of future successful pregnancy in such cases can exceed to over 50 to 60 percent depending on maternal age and parity. So when we actually look at the diagnostic evaluation, one has to understand, can we identify the underlying treatable condition 
to try to improve outcomes. History taking is important, important, important. Previous obstetric history, history of any preterm birth, gestational age, bleeding tendencies have to be emphasized and has to be recorded. Physical examination, general physical assessment, including examination for signs of endocrinopathy is extremely important. So also pelvic organ abnormalities, uterine malformations and cervical lacerations. In all this humdrum, we always forget the mind of that particular couple. Always always as an integral part of a screening program, screen for depression. Because depression is the one thing that many of us fail to recognize. So make sure that if she needs a counselor, this is the time for you to put them across to a counselor or a psychiatrist. What about the antiphospholipid antibodies? Of course you need to do that. The indications would be three or more unexplained spontaneous abortions before the 10th week of gestation after excluding maternal anatomic or hormonal abnormalities and paternal and maternal chromosomal causes. Single unexplained loss of a morphologically normal fetus at more than 10 weeks gestation. Two positive tests at least 12 weeks apart of either lupus anticoagulant or an ACL, IgG or IgM in moderate to high titers that is more than 40 G per liter confirms the diagnosis. Screen for inherited thrombophilias like factor V Leiden and prothrombin gene mutations, protein C protein S thrombo, thrombin deficiencies. A personal history of venous thromboembolism due to non-recurrent risk factors, example surgery, or a first degree relative with a known suspected high risk thrombophilia. Women with any unexplained stillbirth and more than a second trimester loss Uterine factors, then hysteroscopy, laparoscopy, MRI, and a 3D ultrasound, transvaginal or transabdominal ultrasound, sonohistoscopy, and hysterosalpingography may be warranted. Abnormal chromosomes, while chromosomal analysis of both father and mother is mandatory. Abnormal embryonic karyotype, chromosome analysis of the products of conception and endocrine abnormalities requires testing for diabetes, thyroid functions, and prolactin metabolic syndrome, PCOS, as suggested by the history and physical examination. The torch screening, however, has been very controversial, and perhaps in the 90s and late 80s, it had been very rampant to test all these people for torch. However, now, Unless there is anything specific to test, I don't think that torch infection has been has any role at this point of time to test. And when it is tested, it has to be very specific in cases of toxoplasmosis because most of the women are girls are being you know uh, given vaccination for rubella. And so they are always vaccinated for rubella. So it's unlikely that they'll have it. And most of the ones that have herpes are not likely to respond with the early miscarriages. Infections caused by torch agents in women are usually asymptomatic and chronic. Torch infections are associated with recurrent abortions, IUGR, IUD, preterm labor, early neonatal death, and congenital malformations. However, previous history of pregnancy wastages and positive serological tests during the current pregnancy helps to reduce adverse fetal outcome. 
However, even with a positive IgG test, it still does not confirm that the woman has an active infection in this pregnancy. So, if we have antibodies of IgM and IgG against toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex 1 and 2, we need to look at it much more closely. Absence of antibodies indicates a negative result, while presence of antibodies indicates a positive result. A negative result for both IgG and IgM indicates no previous or recent infection. The positive result for IgM and negative result for IgG indicates a recent infection. A positive result for IgG and a negative result for IgM indicates an old infection which may have occurred already or a vaccination. So, if we have to look at the suggested diagnostic evaluation of recurrent pregnancy loss based on etiology, let's look at the summary of the chart on the right hand side. If you look at the genetic thing, you look at the parental karyotype. If it's anatomic, then you look at the HST, an office hysteroscopy. And if you look at the endocrine, you look at the thyroid, the prolactin, the insulin resistance, and perhaps the antithyroid antibodies. If it's infections, no evaluation recommended unless patient has evidence of a chronic endometritis, cervicitis on examination or is immunocompromised. Autoimmune anticardiolipid antibody levels IgG, IgM, lupus anticoagulant. Non-APS thrombophilias, homocysteine, factor 5 laden, prothrombin promoter mutations and activated protein C resistance. So you have a very busy slide here, which is the evaluation of recurrent pregnancy loss, which has been agreed by the RCOG, ASRM, and the HRA recommendations. And if you put them all together here, the HRA has the recent recommendations here, which really tells you a summary of what I have spoken to here to you all along. But it only gives you that summary. Finally, it has to be individualized to each individual case. Nothing can be painted with the same brush. We have to take the patient as a whole. You can't take it to be an organ specific thing. We have to be very clear that when we are taking all these things, do not forget that beyond all this, stress can be a very important factor. You may find nothing wrong with the patient. It could only be a stress factor that has not allowed her to go through the complete pregnancy. And even after leaving all of you, she can still go and have an absolutely normal pregnancy. And believe me, you could have done the maximum number of tests and she would still not have continued the pregnancy. But the moment she has left your clinic and she's gone away from the stressful situation at home and in your clinic, she will go ahead and have an absolutely normal pregnancy and a normal delivery. And I have seen many such cases happening. So the treatment here would be counseling of the couple, investigations and the outcome of investigations, treatment plan and outcome of treatment, psychological support before, during and after is absolutely important. Give strong psychological support to the couple. Genetic counseling, couples with abnormal karyotype detected during the screening period should be referred to a clinical geneticist where available for detailed counseling about outcome of future pregnancies. Lifestyle modifications including weight reduction, exercise, cessation of smoking, limiting alcohol consumption, cannot be overemphasized. So if you looked at this, this again is a busy slide, but
but again is a summary of what I have been telling you on all my previous slides. So the therapeutic interventions for recurrent pregnancy loss based on etiology is all put on this slide for you to see. So this is again a continuation in the treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss, comparison of all the guidelines that you have from the HRA, from the ASRM and the RCOG and all other guidelines. So you have specific treatments for a few of the problems, but you don't have treatment for a lot more problems that you may think that you have cracked the Da Vinci code. But my dear friends, we still have to learn much more and that is empathy, compassion and counseling. That needs to be understood that a lot of empathy and uh, concern has to be given to the woman. It's not easy for a woman to face an abortion. It's not easy for a woman to face that loss. So please understand, it's not so much of a physical problem. It's more of a counseling that needs to be done in this case. And we have to all help this woman to get her status back in society. She should not feel incomplete. She should feel complete. She should feel the complete woman that she is. And just because she has this abortion, she should not feel that she is less of a woman. And when you make her feel that complete, there's a lot of neurotransmitters in the brain that sort of you know, equalizes within itself, which no medicine can do. And I'm sure the doctor has that power that everything cannot be cured by medicine. So tender loving care, TLC, that's not put on my slides. But believe me, that's the strongest medicine that you can give to the patients. Whatever number of tabular columns I can put over here. But that's the biggest tabular column that I can give you throughout my slides. If I tell you that you can do it and this can happen, many of these people will be able to conceive without any of these supports, particularly the unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. So treatment of recurrent pregnancy loss where there is no cause will really be supported by counseling, counseling and more counseling. So the overall prognosis is going to be good. Individual prognosis depends on the over underlying cause and the number of prior losses, correction of endocrine disorders, antiphospholipid antibodies and atomic anomalies have the highest success rates, success rates in patients with cytogenetic basis for the loss is 20 to 80 percent depending on the type of abnormality present. So therefore prognosis depends on the origin of the problem. So evaluate the couple after more than two pregnancy losses to determine the cause of repeated miscarriages, refer to reproductive specialists. Etiologies include antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uterine anomaly abnormalities, hypothyroidism, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, parental chromosomal abnormalities, 50% of recurrent pregnancy loss remains unexplained and that's where the tender loving care comes in. Diagnostic evaluation includes assessment of uterine anatomy and of course antithyroid antibodies and the protein CNS and the antiphospholipid antibodies, factor 5 prothrombin gene mutations and I am not really convinced about the torch infections, antenatal counseling and psychological support. Treatment is directed towards etiology and prognosis depends on the etiology. So in my final slide, I would like to tell you that if you are able to look at the patient as a whole and a mind and body 
and not look at her as a uterus and a pair of ovaries, I think I would have been successful in convincing you people that my lecture today on recurrent pregnancy loss was extremely worth it. Thank you very much. And uh, most of them have been uh, answered uh, during the talks presented, Dr. Kamini's talk and uh, Dr. Ramesh's talk also. But uh, there is one question uh, which I would like to be answered. Is there a, any association of stress with recurrent pregnancy loss? Work related stress or job uh, or, uh, you know, home related stress for a woman which can lead to recurrent pregnancy loss? Can you answer? Can I talk? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, the question was stress. And yes. I fully agree with you that how do you define stress? And there are very many parameters that have actually been laid out on uh, uh, how you grade it. But it depends on different individuals on on how they handle stress. But nevertheless, the overarching factor that stress is a very important factor in recurrent pregnancy loss. So, if we were to look at a whole lot of literature, I'm sure you will have anecdotal experiences where women who have had three and four recurrent pregnancy losses where they have left their original habitat and have moved out be it the home be it the city be it an environment and have settled somewhere else and have found themselves many a time away from that common environment they've been able to have the pregnancy continue without any issues altogether. Perhaps it is the endorphins or the steroid production or it is a question of the chemical neurotransmitters that actually get altered in the system itself that allows for the pregnancy to continue. When we say 50% of these recurrent pregnancy losses for which there is no answer, well stress comes into that category of uh, recurrent pregnancy losses where very very uh, quickly when they actually change this environment and the stress factor you find that results are coming. Uh, thank you ma'am that was very nicely said. Almost all the questions have been answered uh, by your presentation ma'am uh, but there's another question uh, is IVF with pre-implantation genetic screening helpful in unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss? Yes. If IVF is the answer for unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss, is that the question? Uh, uh, no. Uh, is it the answer for, yes, unexplained uh, recurrent pregnancy loss? And uh, PIGD uh, screening they are talking about? No. No. If uh, IVF is done, it should be followed with some kind of P PGT or it should be followed also with, uh, say, for example, ERA, because without that, just doing for an unexplained pregnancy loss, you have to explain something with IVF. Now, when a woman is already getting pregnant and implantation is occurring, there is no point in doing an IVF. However, if you are suspecting the quality of the embryo, then certainly selection of the embryo can be done in the IVF program using either the embryoscope or the PGP and thereby selecting the embryo. So if you are suspecting any kind of an aneuploidy or for example aged oocytes or for example if there are certain you know problems in the endometrium that is uh, not conducive for continuation of the pregnancy and in such situations perhaps an IVF will help. But IVF is not a panacea for unexplained recurrent pregnancy loss. Yes, I agree with you, ma'am. Thank you so much for putting it so nicely across to all of us. Uh, ma'am, there's another question. Uh, are torch uh, infections 
really responsible for recurrent pregnancy loss they are should they be done in today's world uh, as, you know for recurrent pregnancy loss not for one loss but for recurrent pregnancy loss should we do those tests see first and foremost i want to put it very clearly that maybe in the early 90s late 80s early 90s we were doing extensive torch pregnancy tests but when we actually looked at the infertile population and we found that the cytomegaly virus population of an igg was positive in almost 70% of women who are infertile who did not have recurrent pregnancy loss and who were infertile however if you were to look at the pregnant women and who were not pregnant at the time when the testing was done 50% of them had cmv virus positive now the significance of this is that yes they are positive but how many of those cmv virus positive are actually going to affect the fetus now if you look at the cmv virus and you are looking at the igm antibodies for example igg antibodies being positive is of no significance and if igm antibodies one has to actually look at whether the igm antibodies appeared for the first time or there is a rising factor even if you have an igm positive how much of that will actually cross the placental barrier the only way you can find out whether the igm antibody seen in the maternal blood is actually going to infect the fetus is by testing the fetal blood and finding out whether the cord blood has igm antibodies because the igm antibodies of the maternal blood does not cross the placental barrier so if you have tested the cord blood and you find that the igm antibodies emanate from the cord blood then there is a infection in the cord blood then the baby has cmv virus positive now if you look at every igm positive you will hardly have a 0.1% of pregnancies with an igm positive who will have a fetal infection so you must now look back and say am i really going to test so many people to see that 0.1% of uh, babies that are being infected so in fact the royal college as well as the american college have actually done away with testing for torch infections for recurrent pregnancy loss and this has been and once the person has had a torch positive and has been treated question of getting it as repeated treatment is not warranted thank you mom you have actually put it across so well to all of us gynecologists that i think after this we will not make this mistake uh, there's another question that uh, can on ultrasound uh, are there any signs suggestive of an impending uh, pregnancy loss well signs of an impending pregnancy loss again it depends on the time of gestation one is if it's a very early pregnancy loss depends upon at what gestation if it comes before the heart beat obviously you know that most of them will be genetic defects and of aneuploidies and if you are looking at something between the 6 to the 8 week of pregnancy please have a look at where the this thing the gestation sac is whether it is at the lower stage and uh, whether it is implanted low and also the size of the gestation sac whether it is irregular or not you will also have to see where exactly the uh, position of the fetal heart is the rate of that fetal heart sometimes if you get a good fetal heart rate of about 130 or so it's fine but when you see a feeling heart almost like having a flicker and nothing beyond that you know that within a short time that there's going to be a demise also you would be able to see has there been any kind of bleed around that um gestation sac and then you also know that there's a likelihood of that fetus that uh, this is a gestation sac not continuing and uh, you may not always see corpus luteum in the ovary every time but that also could be one of the reasons that not seeing a corpus luteum 
could only be a supportive evidence but may not be the only evidence that uh, the pregnancy is not uh, going well also if you look at the beta hcg values you may not see that significant rise that you would expect the doubling effect of the beta hcg may not be there compared to a healthy pregnancy so these are some of the things that you will be able to see on ultrasound as well as the biochemical parameters thank you ma'am uh, thank you for joining us uh, amit so much of uh, busy schedule of yours i know you were busy somewhere and uh, i took over your uh, presentation and shared it with people it was a real good presentation i must say thank you ma'am uh, and wonderful job thank you very thank much you. and i'm very sorry about this no no yes, no i understand you must have been busy uh, but, but i don't uh, have time. But I'm very happy that uh, I got a chance to talk to the viewers. Maybe sometime I would uh, get a chance to uh, repeat this at some other stage. I think I'll tell Medal people uh, to arrange another one uh, with you, uh, actually talking to the people. And uh, I think Dr. Ramesh is uh, smiling. He will do it. Thank you, you Dr. Ramesh. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank no. you, Medal. Uh, thank one you. One point I. Yes. Yes, please. One please. point I wanted to add on this. Now there are so many causes and so many tests involved. So you talked about some packages early in the day, which is useful for the patient. So I yes, was just wanted to emphasize: yes, there are packages. Some lab called as thrombophilia, some called as thrombocheck, some called as BOA, some called as RPL packages. But yes, we also have like packages: package one, package two, package three, based on the number of tests. Like in all these tests, uh, lupus, anticoagulants, cardiolipin antibodies are there along with uh, protein C, protein S. And then the more you go, factor 5, little mutation, factor 2. So there are packages available. Anti-thrombin 3. Yeah, yeah. Anti-thrombin 3. All costly. Yeah, yeah. So all those are available just for the benefit of the patients. Yes, definitely. But uh, yes, uh, making packages uh, by uh, companies is really helping us because, you know, while uh, listing it down, you may miss out something. And if if we can give uh, some financial help to the patient, uh, they'll really appreciate it. Uh, what does ma'am has to say about it? Dr. Kamini, please. I do not believe in these packages because packages are created by these uh, companies. I would yes. like to look at the individuals and select what is the test I would like to do. Yes. And I would like those tests being done because every individual is unique. And uh, for example, now if I wanted to do a protein C and a protein S, and when you start saying I want protein C, protein S, and they do the entire thrombophilia profile, you see the problem here is the cost factors also. One has to look at the cost factor because once you do a thrombophilia profile, there is such a big hole in the pocket for the patient. Yes. You, know, you have to be very clear, and sometimes you may have to repeat. And uh, this is where I find that, uh, you know, clinical medicine has to take precedence over, you know, the biochemistry and the, you know, these kind of uh, parameters. And I would be more interested if there is a thrombotic episode, the treatment is going to be very similar. So what is the point in trying to look at all the parameters? So I would so like to have a dipsticks method and see that if I am going to be able to treat this patient, then I'd rather spend it on medicine rather than on just investigations. So ma'am so, recommends that we should go on clinical uh, yeah, parameters case basis, more. Yeah, definitely. Yes, yes ma'am. I agree with you. With your experience, uh, no lab matters, no lab tests matter. Uh, that is true. Yes, I wouldn't want to do because, you know, many times they'll say whole body scan or they'll say whole body test, etc. Who wants whole body tests? I mean, you may do a marketing gimmick, but that may not be required for the patient. Yes, I agree with you. Isn't it? Yes, ma'am, I agree with you. So totally I am agree a with you. believer is only because I make sure that I want to give I what the patient right? deserves. Huh? Rather than say you take one and then you get three free. And actually nothing comes mm -hmm. free. Nothing comes free. They are all hidden, hidden costs, yes. yes. So, uh, if there is nothing else, uh, I would like to conclude this meeting by first of all, uh, first and foremost and maximum thanks to Dr. Kamini for joining us amidst a busy schedule. Uh, thanks to Bedal and uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh and uh, 
uh, namaste from kk med talks and hope to see you soon uh, good night thanks a lot ma'am thanks a lot thanks. thank you